You seem upset, Holden. What's going on? I think I just bombed that exam. Yeah, me too. That was pretty rough. Go, Holden. You really need to step it up. This is not a good performance. Oh my gosh. This really isn't good, Holden. I think you should consider seeing our tutors. Tired of failing your classes? Are your clinicals filled with explosions and crashes? If you and your friends want to rock like we do, give us a call! We're ready to teach you! Aspiration to septic shock. So the beginning phases is that the patient aspirates some kind of foreign object into their respiratory cavity. This progresses to an infection. Usually we're probably gonna see pneumonia. Um, after the infection develops, the patient is gonna develop something called SEERS, which is systemic inflammatory response syndrome. So the capillaries get really leaky, edema happens. Um, this leads to sepsis, um, secondary to the systemic inflammation. Um, this becomes severe sepsis and we start to see a little bit of organ damage. Then we are led to septic shock where we're gonna see severe hypotension. Um, diminished perfusion to all of our major organs, things like that, which may eventually lead to MODS, which is multi-organ damage syndrome. So we're gonna see ARDS, AKI, um, DIC, heart failure, liver failure, all the things. This is really difficult to recover from, unlikely for the patient to recover at this point, but we do our best. Um, once we reach septic shock, we have some stages. So we have the introductory phase. This is a very early stage of septic shock where you're not gonna see any um, symptoms from your patient, but if you have your patient on hemodynamic monitoring, you may see it um, on their CVP, their pulmonary artery pressure, things like that. Then we move to the compensatory phase where you're gonna start to see some symptoms from your patient. They may be um, tachypnic, confused. Um, for septic shock with infection, you may see um, like flushing from vasodilation. You're gonna see a drop in blood pressure. You're gonna see a raise in the heart rate. The body is trying to compensate and send blood to the major organs to save our brain and our heart and um, lungs. So at this point, we're gonna go to the progressive stage. We're gonna start to see damage on our kidneys. We're gonna start to see increased um, issues with mentation. So your patient may become obtunded, um, difficult to arouse. Um, you're gonna start to see a lot of edema from the inflammation and the capillaries are leaking. So you're really gonna see a lot of progression in this stage and we really need to try to catch our patient before they kind of progress beyond this point. Um, they're gonna start to have really profound hypotension. And then if we don't save them at this point, they are gonna probably go to the refractory or irreversible phase where um, profound hypotension is so severe that we can no longer perfuse the organs even with pressors or anything like that. So unfortunately at this point, we're gonna probably reach mods, lots of organ damage and the more organs that are damaged, the less likely our patient is to survive. So the pathophysiology that leads from pneumonia to septic shock is a little bit complex. So let's start with pneumonia. Aspiration causes the normal clearance mechanisms to be overwhelmed by the infective organism. A large influx of phagocytic cells in exudate enter the airways and alveoli, um, and the inflammatory response to these pathogens leads to a ventilation perfusion mismatch. Then you have SEERS, which is a progression from the infection where the pro-inflammatory cytokines released during the local inflammatory response overwhelm the anti-inflammatory cytokines. Um, and this leads to the systemic inflammatory response. Now on to sepsis. The systemic inflammatory response plus the infection leads to an increased permeability of the endothelial wall, shifting fluids from the intravascular space to the extravascular space. So in the bloodstream to out of the bloodstream. It can also cause microvascular clotting, impaired fibrinolysis, and widespread vasodilation. Um, all of these factors in sepsis then progress further um, and this leads to severe circulatory and cellular or metabolic abnormalities that increase the chance of mortality. Signs and symptoms, septic shock. We got temperature over 38 degrees, that's for infection. When you move on to Sears criteria, you're looking at temperature over 38 degrees Celsius or less than 36 degrees Celsius. Your heart rate's also gonna be over 90, your respiratory rate's gonna be over 20, PaCO2 less than 32, White blood cells, uh, they're gonna be greater than 12,000 or less than 10,000, 4,000. Or you're gonna have greater than 10% bands. Um, 
When you move on to sepsis, you have serious criteria plus infection. And then moving on to severe sepsis, you have evidence of end organ damage. This is like elevated bun, creatinine, uh, ALTs, and ASTs. Um, and then when we get to our septic shock criteria, we have hypotension added in the mix. So when we're doing our head to toe assessment, we might find patients that are breathing very rapidly. Um, their heart rate's gonna be increased. Uh, they're gonna be anuretic. They might have jaundice. Um, they're gonna have an arrhythmias. Um, they might have diarrhea. They're gonna be lethargic. Uh, they're gonna have flushed skin and possibly anasarca. So let's talk about some comorbidities or risk factors for developing sepsis secondary to aspiration. So some of these risk factors can include patients um, with ages over 65 years, um, that can contribute to a slower healing process. Patients with weakened immune systems, such as those with age extremities like elderly or um, infants, autoimmune diseases, HIV, transplant patients, etc. Um, some chronic medical conditions can also contribute to developing sep sepsis, which includes diabetes, kidney disease, COPD, and also prolonged mechanical ventilation. Um, so as for patients most at risk for aspiration, this includes patients with NG tubes or Dobhoff tubes, especially if nurses aren't checking um, for gastric residual each time they um, give a feeding. Uh, patients with stroke or dysphagia, um, patients undergoing oral airway or throat procedures, or patients with analgesia to the throat can um, increase their risk for aspiration. So how may this affect pathophysiology? Aspiration makes the respiratory system more vulnerable to outside pathogens, increasing the risk of developing pneumonia and therefore leading to possible septic shock. Three nursing interventions that we're going to do is first identify the source of infection, obtain blood, sputum, urine, ventilator, and catheter tip cultures to identify the source. After identifying the source, um, we're going to start antibiotics to help decrease the progression. And then the next intervention is a fluid bolus or vasopressors. We're going to advocate for using normal saline or D5 or norepi and vasopressin. Due to refractory hypertension and tissue hyperperfusion, administering pressors or fluids will help maintain the map and you want to make sure to maintain the map of greater than 65. The last intervention is draw serum lactate levels. Uh, we're going to need to draw these frequently to assess the patient's progression of in septic shock. Serum lactate levels greater than two after fluids or greater than four without fluids. Make sure to redraw and monitor and hope that they trend down. Serum lactate levels represent anaerobic metabolism and can lead to organ failure if levels are too high. Boom. <laughs> All right. Okay, so for the patient education um, pertaining to septic shock, our first education point is we want to ensure that everybody that is entering the room or leaving the room, that includes family or friends or nurses or doctors, is doing hand hygiene, which means pumping the hand sanitizer and washing. Um, this just will help prevent infection. And then we also want to make sure that the patient knows to change position slowly if they're awake. Um, because there is profound hypotension with septic shock, so um, changing position slowly will help um, decrease the risk of falls and just, yeah, keep the patient safe. And then our last education point is if family sitting in the room and the nurse isn't um, actively caring for the patient, um, just to notify the family if they notice any changes in their loved one, like restlessness, confusion, agitation, or if the patient suddenly becomes unresponsive to go ahead and notify a nurse or a medical provider. So what are the potential complications associated with the treatments of septic shock? So as a nurse, you will administer a fluid bolus challenge. You want to be monitoring your patient for fluid volume overload, crackles in the lungs, edema, and shortness of breath. Additionally, you want to monitor for electrolyte imbalances, prolonged QT intervals, peaked T waves, and muscle weakness. Be cautious in patients with renal issues, cardiac issues, and your elderly and pediatric patients. Additionally, you will administer broad spectrum antibiotic therapy. As a nurse, you want to wait until after blood cultures to initiate therapy. Be sure to monitor your patient for nausea and diarrhea 
secondary to C. diff, and monitor for anaphylactic reaction. Your pa patient will also be on vasopressors, so ensure that you monitor your patients for early signs of tissue necrosis, such as mottled skin. Monitor your ECG, your IV sites, and other symptoms such as hypertension in patients on vasopressors. Some risk and benefits of the varying treatments of this disease process is antibiotics. Like stated before, it can cause adverse reactions, allergic reactions, and any other different types of side effects. Super infections such as C. diff and antibiotic resistance. Some benefits from antibiotics is the clearance of the infection. Risk for fluid bolus is fluid volume overload, electrolyte imbalances, pulmonary edema, and hemodilution. Some benefits are improved vascular volume and tone, hemodynamic stability, increased cardiac output, and improved perfusion. Some risk for vasopressors is necrosis, hypertension, dysrhythmias, angina, and hyperglycemia. Some benefits from vasopressors are increased blood pressure, perfusion, MAP, and increased vascular resistance. Um, during our son of a gun. <laughs> Some comorbidities or risk factors for developing sex seps. <laughs> Man, hold him. What's wrong? Dang it, Charlotte. Are you tired of failing your classes? Are your clinicals filled with crashes and explosions? <laughs> Are you tired of failing your classes? <laughs> you and your friends want to rock like you do. <laughs> that was great. Good job. Killed it. Are you